Good morning. Welcome once again to Community Bible Church of Concrete, or wherever you happen to be, Community Bible Church of your living room. Uh, we really appreciate everyone who comes on. Rob is, uh, I'm sure you know by now, an incredible teacher. He brings the Word in an amazing way, and we are very blessed to have him. And uh, the Word of God is, is an amazing thing to hear, an amazing thing to learn, and, uh, well, it's an amazing thing to worship God for it. So let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how it guides and loves and, and for the toughness of it as well, Father, that we can use it in so many ways in our lives. Lord, thank you again for such a great teacher like Rob and, and for the way that he brings the word and makes it understandable to people like me that sometimes have a hard time understanding. Lord, your, your word can be so simple and so easy to understand. Just love each other and love one another. Love the Lord thy God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And yet it could be so deep that the scholars can argue forever and never come up with the deepest answers. But Father, that's who you are. You are incredibly deep in every way. You are involved in our lives in ways that we'll never know. We'll never be able to see. And Father, you are, you are still there right in front of us, touchable, reachable. Thank you, Father, for the relationship that you have with us. Thank you that you are reachable bowing our heads, closing our eyes, or even just driving down the road and turning our hearts and our minds towards you. And you're always right there with open arms and ready for us. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We have Miss Shirley on the piano today, and they hardly ever get on camera, which they are thankful for. Yes. And we say whatever, but she's very, 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 very happy and very, very good to be here. Thank you so much, Shirley. You're welcome. And we're going to go through several hymns, and we're going to start with a reading. Pr uh, praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him from the firmament of his power. Praise him for the, his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery. Praise him with the triple and dance. Praise him with stringed instrument and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Oh 
chapter 1 verse 27 but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty those words very well sum up the life and the ministry of Jonah we've spent these past five weeks exploring not only the book of Jonah but the person of Jonah but one of the things that we've learned is the book of Jonah is not really all about Jonah. It's not about the great fish. It's not even about the Ninevites. It's about God. It's about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, the Bible is God's revelation of himself. In Psalm 40, verse 7, it says, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. So from Genesis to Revelation, we have God revealing himself. But as I said, not only himself as Father, but Jesus as Son and the Holy Spirit. Last Sunday, we concluded our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Jonah. And in doing so, I asked you to do something. I asked you to once again read the book of Jonah, four chapters, 48 verses, and ask yourself the following question. What does this book teach or reveal about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Because anytime we go into the scriptures, we want to know what we're learning of God and from God. If this were my adult Sunday school class, we'd have a great opportunity to exchange what we've learned during the week. But since this is the, the worship service, I'm going to, to preach and I'm going to share my revelations, what I've observed about God from this book. And, and I want to do this in two parts. I want to, first of all, look at the character and the conduct of God. And then we'll address Jesus in a few moments. So going back to Jonah chapter 1, as we look at the character and conduct of God, remember, Jonah chapter 1, the theme was running from the Lord. So what did we learn about God? Let me share four things from chapter one. First of all, chapter one, verse one, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. One of the things that we've learned is that God continues to speak to us today. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter four, for the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and of the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God is still speaking to us today. It may not be in an audible voice as it has been to some of the prophets, but when it says the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, we can easily say the word of the Lord has come unto us. God continues to speak to us. The second thing we learn is found in verse 2. He tells Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. 
So what do we learn about God? Well, we learn that God continues to call us to share his message. The familiar words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Paul puts it a little bit different in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says that we have been given a ministry. Every follower of Jesus has been given a ministry. It's the ministry of reconciliation. We have a message to share that reconciles God and man. And so the, the second thing we learn of God in, ch in chapter 1 is that God calls every one of us to share his message. The third thing we learn is found in verse 4, but the Lord sent out a great wind. God controls his creation. What's really interesting is, is at the time of Jonah's ministry, there were two great plagues in this area in 765 B.C., in 759 BC, and plagues were viewed as a judgment from God. In 763 BC, there was a total uh, eclipse of the sun. Now, we know what an eclipse is about, but imagine back then with the limited knowledge they have, and the moon goes in front of the sun and, and literally blocks out the rays of the sun, even however briefly. See, God is controlling his creation. He did so then, and he does so today. A fourth thing that we learn in chapter uh, 1 is verse 17. It says, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Remember, Jonah had been thrown into the water. The sailors had determined he was the cause of all that was going on. They threw him in the water. God could have easily had let Jonah drown. But God loved Jonah, God called Jonah, and he prepared a great fish to save Jonah. So four things we learn about God from chapter one. He continues to speak today. Every one of us have been given a message from him. He controls his creation and he loves us. What do we learn about God from chapter two? The theme of chapter two, praying to the Lord. Let me share three things that we learn about God from chapter two. First of all, God hears our prayer. Chapter two, verse one, that Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 59, behold, the Lord's hand is not too short that it cannot save, neither his ear too heavy that it cannot hear. Just as God heard Jonah's prayers, he hears our prayers. And we learn that in our study of the book of Jonah. The second thing we learn about God from chapter two is that he is omnipresent. We see this in verse six of Jonah chapter two. Jonah says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth, her bars were about me forever. Yet thou has brought up me from that corruption, O Lord my God. Wherever Jonah went, God was still there. The testimony of scripture is wherever we go, God is still there. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, we read, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. God is omnipresent. Wherever we go, God's presence is there. The third thing we learn from chapter 2 about God is not only does he hear our prayers, but he answers our prayers. Chapter 2, verse 10, and the Lord spoke unto the fish. He heard Jonah's prayer. And he answered it in a way that, that the fish responded to the command of God. Isn't it interesting that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. God not only hears our prayers, God answers our prayers. But it is conditional. Jesus said in John chapter 15, If... That's conditional. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. God not only hears our prayers, but he will answer them conditional upon us abiding and walking with him. But once again, we learn this all the way back in Jonah chapter two. 
So Jonah chapter 1, running from the Lord. Jonah chapter 2, praying to the Lord. What do we learn about God from chapter 3? Well, in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time. One of the things we learn is that God gives second chances. We're told in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we receive forgiveness, we receive a second chance. Once again, the book of Jonah revealing to us about who God is. The second thing we learn in chapter 3 is found in verse 5. It says, so the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. What do we learn? We learn that God's word changes lives. Remember, Jonah's message was just eight words. Five words in the Hebrew. And in just those five words, it was powerful enough to bring about the greatest revival recorded in Scripture. Some estimate upwards to 600,000 people got saved from a brief five-word message. You know what the Apostle Paul says? In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. God's word changes lives. And the third thing that we learn from chapter three, that God responds to our works. Verse 10 of chapter three, and God saw their works. And the verse continues that he did not bring the judgment. He responded to not their words, but to their works. Once again, the book of Romans it confirms this uh, when he tells us that we shall be held accountable for our works. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, every man's work shall be made manifest or every man's work shall be revealed for the day will declare it and it will be revealed by fire. All of our works will ultimately be judged. That which was done from a selfish motive will be will be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. But that which was done for the glory of God will remain forever. See, God responds to our works just as it responded in the day of Jonah. One final chapter. What do we learn about God from chapter four? First of all, in verse two, we learn that God's character is multifaceted. Look with me in Jonah chapter four, verse two. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. And note what we learn about the character of God. You are gracious, you are merciful, you are slow to anger, and you're of great kindness and full of compassion. God's character is multifaceted. And as I shared last week from chapter four, he's quoting essentially uh, the book of Exodus chapter 34, verses five and six, which reveal once again, the character of God. It says the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. The second thing we learn about God from this chapter is that God is patient with us. In chapter 4, verse 4, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Rather than rebuking Jonah, he's very patient with Jonah, just as God is patient with us. Listen to the words of Peter. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men are, but God is long-suffering. That's King James for saying God is patient with us. And he's patient with us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Chapter four reveals, first of all, God's character is multifaceted. Second of all, he is patient with his children. Verse eight teaches us that God tests us. 
Chapter uh, 4, verse 8, and it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared this vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah. God tests his children. He doesn't tempt us. He tests us because he seeks to purify us. And we see this confirmed with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested of the devil. God leads his son to be tested. Not to tempt him, not to trip him up, but to make him relatable to us so that we can see that Jesus endured trials. Jesus endured challenges. And sometimes those trials and challenges come from God himself. The third thing we learned, or excuse me, that was a third thing. The, the final thing, at least that I'm sharing today, that we learn about God is that he is full of compassion. And at the end of the book, chapter 4, verse 11, God says, and should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, great in size and great in wickedness. But he has compassion on them. The prophet Jeremiah, known as, as the weeping prophet, as, as he laments what is happening to his nation in the Old Testament. He writes in Lamentations chapter three, this I recall to mind and therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. The compassion he showed in the Old Testament is the compassion he shows in the New Testament. And so just Four things in chapter one, three things in chapter two, three things in chapter three, four things in chapter four. What do we learn about the character and the conduct of God? That which is seen in the Old Testament, that which is seen in the book of Jonah is confirmed in the New Testament. The second part, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Matthew chapter 12, because I want to address the calling of, and the compassion of Jesus. It's not just about the character and conduct of God, but remember, one of the things that makes this book so unique is Jonah is the only prophet of all the prophets that Jesus likens himself to. And he does so in Matthew chapter 12. Now let me give you the context. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 13, Jesus is showing his lordship over the Sabbath. And then, beginning in chapter 12, verse 14 uh, through 45, we see the opposition to Jesus by the religious leaders of the day. But in Matthew chapter 12, note how Jesus responds to the opposition of the religious leaders of the day. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. It says, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees, those are the religious leaders, leaders of the day, they said, Master, we want to see a sign from you. Well, Jesus had already done miracles, but they wanted yet another one. And here's how Jesus responds. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So what Jesus does is he ties himself back to the ministry of Jonah. We cannot believe the ministry of Jesus and not believe the ministry of Jonah. To believe Jesus is to believe the story of Jonah. And so what did we learn about Jesus? First of all, his calling. He refers to himself in his favorite description. Eighty times in the New Testament, he refers to himself as the Son of Man. It goes all the way back to the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man, referencing the coming Messiah. That title is used. And so when Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, he understands his calling. He understands and he embraces his identity. But not only do we see the calling of Jesus, we see the compassion of Jesus. He says in verse 40 of Matthew 12, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, 
so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, what's Jesus referencing? He's referencing the reality of his coming crucifixion. He's referencing the reality that he will die on a cross for our sins. And for the first time in all of his relationship with the Father, which is from eternity past, for the first time, he will be separate from the Father. That's why he cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because Jesus understands this separation must happen because he must die in our place. And Jesus communicates compassion to you and I. Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's his compassion. That's his love. That's his calling. I like how um, the gospel of Mark puts it in Mark chapter 10. He says, for the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The gospel of Luke is summed up in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's you and I. That's the compassion of Jesus. He takes our sins upon himself. He becomes sin for us. And he experiences the wrath and the righteousness of his Father which is in heaven. Why? So that we may, as Colossians 1 says, we may be delivered from darkness into his marvelous, wonderful light. See, that's the compassion of Jesus. And that's the calling of Jesus. And it all ties back into this book, this book of Jonah, four chapters, 48 verses. We learn of the character and the conduct of God. We learn of the calling and compassion of Jesus. All from the life and ministry of Jonah. So these uh, six weeks, I've preached on this book. And, and I've had two goals. I always have two goals whenever I preach or teach. They're summed up in John chapter 17. For this is eternal life that they may know thee, the Father which has sent me, and the Son. The two goals I have whenever I preach or teach, goal number one, information. We need to know about God. We do that through the study of his word. The second goal is not just information, it's intimacy. We not only need to know about God, we need to know God. It's about relationship. So how do we accomplish that? Well, when, when you're listening to somebody preach or teach, you fall into one of three categories. To the best of my understanding, there's only three categories of people who are listening. There's category number one, they have no information about God and they have no intimacy with God. That's category. There are those that have, they don't know anything about God and they certainly don't have any relationship with God. There's a second category. There are those who have some information about God, but still have no intimacy, no relationship with God. There is a third category. There are those who have information about God and have a relationship with God. And so I want to bring this six-week six study uh, to a, a conclusion. And, and here it is. It's very simple. First of all, I want you to have information about God. That's the purpose for this message today. Information about God. What do we learn about the, the, the character and the conduct of God? Uh, I, I shared, I believe, 14 things that we learned in those four chapters. But that's not enough. It's my desire that not only do we have information, but we have intimacy. We have relationship. As I said, John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus says, this is eternal life. Not only that we know 
about the Father. Not only that we know about the Son, but that we have relationship, personal relationship. How does that happen? Very simple. It's what I refer to as the ABCs. We first of all acknowledge that we are sinners. We acknowledge that we have fallen short of the standard of God. Second of all, that we believe in the work and in the ministry of Jesus Christ. But thirdly, that belief is revealed when we confess and we repent of sins. When we acknowledge that we're a sinner, when we believe in the work and words of Jesus Christ, and when we respond to that belief by confessing and repenting of sin, we move from having just information about God to having intimacy and relationship with God. And that's the ultimate goal. That is the decision that we make that decides where we spend eternity. That's why even though we go through a relatively brief book, four chapters, 48 verses, from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 11, it is all about God. As I said, and I don't mean to be repetitive, but I want to drive the home of this point home. It's about the character and the conduct of God. Jonah is just a bit part player. It's about the character and the conduct of God, and it is about the calling and the compassion of Jesus Christ. It is not just about information, it is about intimacy. And my goal is that you have both. As a result of this six-week study, we've learned things about God. But let's move from just knowing about God to knowing God personally and having that intimate, abiding relationship with him because that's what eternal life is all about that's the decision that not only changes you now but changes you for all of eternity let's pray father thank you for your word old and new testament thank you for what it reveals about you as father about jesus as son and about the holy spirit I pray, Father, that through these six weeks, we we've not only gained additional information about you, but, Father, we've been motivated to have a deeper relationship with you. And so, Father, that is my prayer for all those who are hearing this message. Not only information, but intimacy. A personal relationship. Lord, I pray that you would not only hear my prayer, but that you would answer it so that lives are changed for all of eternity. This I ask in your son's most precious name. Amen. Thy mountain